et bienvenue à ma chaîne Histoire Mystérieuse. And tonight, I have a story of a serial killer, Terry Rasmussen, and some of his victims, known and unknown. A dedicated detective refused to stop digging after she solved the brutal murder of a chemist in California. Then by reopening an earlier case, she helped a genetic genealogist to discover the identity of a girl the killer claimed was his daughter, and then the killer's true identity. Their, ad their hard work, along with that of a dog researcher, ultimately unraveled a long trail of missing and murdered women and children, all leading back police says, to a serial killer. Terry Rasmussen poses here for arrest in a photo from 1973, Maricopa, Phoenix. Known by lengthy list of allies, Terry Peter Rasmussen has been dubbed the chameleon killer for assuming so many different identities as he infiltrated families and destroyed lives in New Hampshire and California. So our suspect started in 1984 as Curtis Kimball. Then he, was, he had Gordon Jensen. Then he was using Larry Vanner. And now it turns out in the early 1980s, back in New Hampshire, he was using Bob Evans. San Bernardino County, California, Sheriff Deputy Peter Avery explained all the same guy. Rasmussen had been linked to five horrific murders and authorities fear there are more. These are the stories of the woman and children he is suspected of killing. One he confessed to murdering and those whose life he changed forever. Victims tied to Rasmussen, Marilise Elizabeth Honey Church, who was born in Connecticut in 1954, was married twice and had a daughter with each husband. Mary Yvonne was first born in 71, Sarah was born in 77, according to New Hampshire Department of Justice. Honey Church sister Roxanne Barrows and Michelle Chagari remember her as bubbly and quirky and said she had a good sense of humor. Marilise was excited to be a mom. She loved her kids dearly. We can see Marilise on the church here on the picture was last seen around Thanksgiving 1978 with her two daughters, Mary and Sarah. On the church was last seen at her mother's house in La Puente, California around Thanksgiving in 1978. It was there that she introduced her family to her boyfriend. Terry Rasmussen, according to New Hampshire Department of Justice, I don't remember exactly what happened, Paula Hodge, Honey Church's Hodge sister, told 2020, I just heard that they had an argument, Marlies and my mom. My mom might have said something to her as is too old for you. Why are you with him? Hodge said, she went with Terry and they left. Never call, never contacted Buddy. Nobody just disappeared. Annie Church was 24 at the time, according to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Police believe she died one to, to two years later, making her 26 to 27 when she died. David Salamon, Annie Church's brother, remembered the length to which their family went to find Annie Church and her daughters. It was just a situation where every time we searched, we came to a dead end came to a dead end, to a dead end, Solomon said, her brother. Through the years, my mother always said, you know, something's not right. Where is she? I just remembered. It was sad, Solomon said. We had a sister that was gone, a sister and two nieces. The remain of Mary and her mother on the church were found in the first of two barrels that were discovered at Bear Brook State Park in November 1985. They weren't identified until 2019 
at that time. Authorities believe Mary was 8 to 10 years old at the time of her death. Here in this picture, you see Mary Vaughn was last seen with her mother and sister at a Thanksgiving gathering in 1978. It was very surreal that a mother and daughter were actually inside the barrel itself, disposed of like common trash. John Cody, a former New Hampshire State Police detective, told 2020. Jesse Morgan, who grew up in a small trailer park surrounded by bear book, was 11 when he and his friends stumbled upon the barrel. We were playing a game of hide and seek, Morgan told 2020. I was approached by one of the kids in the group that he had come upon a barrel out in the middle of the woods, which was off the trail. I was just odd that the barrel was out there. It was a slightly rusted, dark blue barrel. It's a blue 55 gallon steel drum. It's just kind of sitting out in the woods. You see here in the picture, Jesse Morgan, who grew up in a small trailer park surrounded by a bear book, was a living at that time. The brother was found the barrel. The brother that found the barrel went over to it and tried to lift the top of the barrel. And when he did that, we were hit with a smell that was absolutely putrid. One of the brothers just pushed the barrel over and we watched the barrel fall on its side. Morgan said, the guy jumped on my four-wheeler and we booted out of there and that was the last time that we saw the barrel. At the time, Morgan and his friend didn't know they were remaining inside the barrel. Four months later, Ron Montplaisir, who was an Allen Stone, New Hampshire police officer at the time, got a call from a dispatch to meet a hunter at the edge of the woods. He was very, very white, very pale. Montplaisir told 2020, he said to me, there's a barrel up in the woods and I think there's some bones in there. See this picture, Ron Montplaisir. Police later determined the female adult and child unidentified at the time had died of blunt force trauma to their heads. They were buried together at a local Allenstown cemetery with a donated gravestone that read, Here lies the mortal remains known only to God of a woman aged 23 to 33 and a girl child aged 8 to 10. Their slain, slain bodies were found on November 10th, 1985, in Bear Brook State Park. May their soul find peace in God's love and care. On June 8, 2000, the remains of Mary and Annie Church, which were still unidentified at the time, were exhumed from the grave by authorities for DNA testing. In 2000, 15 years after the first barrel was discovered, Sarah's body was found inside a separate barrel at Bear Brook State Park along with the body of an unknown child. Sarah is believed to have been two to three years old at the time she was killed, according to authorities. Sarah, her half-sister Mary, and their mother, Annie Church, were unknown person, authorities announced their identities at a press conference on June 6. Rebecca Hell, a research librarian who said she'd become obsessed with the case, helped identify the women and the two children through her own sleuthing on an online message board. She connected with a woman who was looking for a missing family member, a woman and her two daughters whose age and location matched that of Annie Church, Sarah and Mary. The woman also told, helped that her missing family member had once married a man with the last name Rasmussen. As help was calling the tip to authorities, investigative genetic genealogist Barbara Ray Venter was also uncovering the three victims' identities through a new technique that involved extracting DNA from the shaft of a strand of air. In November 2019, Annie Church and her older daughter, Mary Vaughn, were laid to rest together with a new headstone bearing their name in Allen, Allen Stone, New Hampshire. Annie Church Younger's daughter, Sarah, was laid to rest in Connecticut near her father's family. We're here today to bury my sister and my niece, Salomon said at Annie Church and Mary's funeral. 
We as a family would like to thank the community for caring and loving our sister Marlies and our nieces, Mary and Sarah. We have looked and searched for over 30 years for them with no luck. We have never stopped looking, he said. Although this moment is bittersweet, they add their name back on this day. They can rest in peace. Thank you all from the bottom of our heart. You can see in the picture here, the uncle, the brother, David Salomon, and Paul the Alge. Unchurched siblings. Unknown child. The remain of a young girl, aged two to four, was found in the second barrel with Sarah's remain in 2000. To this day, she has yet been identified. New Hampshire authorities have referred to her as the middle child because of how her suspected age compares to the other two children found in the barrels. But DNA tests confirm she is not related to Sarah and Mary, nor their mother. In 2016, this child was determined to be Rasmussen's biological daughter. You know people ask me why I do these interviews? It's because there is still one victim out there. Former Detective Cody said, there's one girl who you won't know who she is. That's why I do this, to get her identified. And so that's their closure for the families involved here. That's the only reason, Salomon said. He and his family called the girl Angel. The focus from this day forward should be to find a family of that little girl, he said. Hun Sun Jun, a chemist from California, was the first victim authorities were able to tie to Rasmussen. Jun was in her mid-40s when she introduced her family to her new boyfriend, Larry Vanner, whom authorities later identified as Rasmussen, according to the New Hampshire Department of Justice. Here's a picture of Jun when she was in her mid-40s, when she was introduced in um, Bruce Masson to her family. He didn't even look healthy. His face was gray. He smoked constantly. June's friend Renee Rose told 2020 Larry would just grab and gobble up everything on the table and belch and eat more and then he'd go sit on the couch. June disappeared from Richmond, California in June 2000 or she was going to get some therapeutic help. Rose said Vanner told her he would say she decided she didn't like me anymore and didn't want me in her life. Who could believe him for one second? Rose said she told him, I want Usan, not you. I want Usan to tell me that she's done with our relationship or I'm going to get the sheriff involved. Rose ultimately went to the Contra Costa County Sheriff where Roxanne Gruhan was homicide detective. He was polite and soft-spoken and very smart, and with his twinkly blue eyes, he could get somebody to maybe trust him. Gruhan held till 2020. All we were really trying to do was to determine where Usun was and if she was okay. And he wasn't being cooperative with that at all. When somebody's story keeps changing, it means that they have either made something up, can't remember what they told you the first time, or that they're lying to you. While searching Vanner's California home, Boone hid and a fellow detective located an enormous pile of cat litter in a crawl space. Big like four or five feet around, and probably two or three feet high, she said. I stood there. For just a few seconds, there was no order, I remember, seeing an axe leaning up there. Buried in the cat litter, police found a human foot completely mummified, wearing a flip-flop. Ultimately, the body was identified as June, who police determined had died of blunt force trauma to the head. When I got up in the morning, I pulled my shades back. There was clouds and a beautiful blue sky, and there was seagulls circling in the sky. They were beautiful, and I went, this can't be. Rose said of learning her friend was gone. I closed the blinds back up. How could it be bright and sunny when Usun's dead? 
Fu Han said she later said of learning her friend was gone. I closed the blinds back up. How could it be bright and sunny when Wu Sun's dead? Fu Han said she later determined a match matching Vanner's description had bought 10 bags of cat litter from a nearby pet store in November 2002. He was arrested for June's murder in 2003. He was sentenced to prison for 15 years to life after he pled guilty to the crime. Vanner died in prison in December 2010 of natural causes. His true identity, Terry Rasmussen, was not revealed by authorities until 2017. I guess dying serves him right, Rose said. I wish he'd lived longer so he would have served longer in prison. There's probably more vi victim from, uh, from Ramsu Rasmussen. In 1981, Denise Baudin went missing shortly after Thanksgiving with her six-month-old daughter and her boyfriend Rasmussen at the time, whom she had known as Robert T. Evans, according to the New Hampshire Department of Justice. Here's a picture of Denise Baudin when she uh, went missing shortly after Thanksgiving with her six-month-old daughter in 1981. I don't think they're ever going to find her. Bowden's father, Armand Bourdain, said there's always that hope, but nothing's definite. Decades later, investigators discovered that Denise Bourdain was the mother of the child known as Lisa. A little girl, Rasmussen, claimed in the 1980s was his daughter, which DNA tested later confirmed wasn't true. Denise Baudin was never been located. When Lisa was taken into protective custody in 1986, police asked if she had any siblings. Police believe her answer indicates they may have been killed by Rasmussen too. She said that she did, but they died from eating grass mushroom when they were out camping, the pretty Edley said, which says, yeah, there's more victim out there, definitely. Kimbo Curtis, when he changed name again. The mother of middle child, e. Terry Ram Rasmussen posed here as Curtis Kimbo. The mother of the middle child, the mother of the middle child, the unidentified girl in the second barrel found at Bear Brooks in 2000, who was determined to be Rasmussen, biological daughter, as has also never been found nor identified. Authorities fear both Bodai and the unidentified mother of the middle child are other possible victim of Rasmussen. We do regrettably fear that this daughter's mother is probably another victim somewhere. Carol Switzer of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children said, there's other victims. In 1995, Scanven just found a refrigerator containing what former San Joaquin County Assistant Sheriff John Ubert Believes maybe another one of Rasmussen victim. The refrigerator had been dumped in a canal in San Joaquin County, California. The scavengers actually walked out in the middle of the canal because it was just mud. Cut the rope and open it up here, and that's when they saw what they thought was a human behind, being a human being inside. Uber told 2020. Here's a picture of the 1995 scavengers found a refrigerator containing what former detective John Huber believes may be another one of Rasmussen's victims. The refrigerator had been dumped in a canal. Hubaya said the body of a woman was found in a state of advanced decomposition and police couldn't dis discern the woman's facial features. She had been placed in the refrigerator with a pillow sleeping bag and what appeared to be several blankets, he said. Also in the refrigerator was a unique brand of milk that was only delivered to a certain area that matched up with where Rasmussen had been at the time, Huber said. Additionally, Huber said the woman remained bore the hallmarks of Rasmussen's other victim. She had blunt force trauma to the head and then she was put in a container and the container was tied off and he dumped it, he said. Huber says the investigation is stopped because she is still unidentified. 
first thing we need to do is find out who she is. Because without knowing who she is, it's pretty hard to track back and find out where she stayed and who her relatives were and who she associated with. He said, it well could be Terry. It well could be somebody else. But I think until we know her identity, we're not going to solve the case. Here's a picture of Terry Rasmussen poses as Larry Vanner in 2002. Lisa, in the early 1980s, a man who said his name was Gordon Jensen was living in a trailer park in California with a little girl he called Lisa, who police say was about 45 years old at the time. Jason arranged for Lisa to be taken to Southern California for two weeks with another family, Catherine and Richard Decker. Jensen said after those two weeks, the Deckers could arrange for their daughter to adopt Lisa, police said. The Deckers came to believe Lisa might have been abused. When they reached out to Jensen again to finalize the adoption, he had disappeared. After Jensen disappeared, the Deckers were unable to complete the adoption and Lisa was taken into protective custody. In 1989, Jason later identified as Rasmussen, was assisted, arrested for child abandonment and was subsequently sentenced to three years in prison. Under his plea agreement, an additional charge of child abuse was dropped. Upon Rasmussen's relief from prison, according to the State of California Department of Correction, he broke parole and fled, Brunet said. Years later, when Bruin took on the Usen June missing person case in 2002, she became determined to find out more about Rasmussen's supposed daughter, Lisa, who had been mentioned in his criminal history, including prior booking records. There were little fingerprinting cards with these little tiny little hands and had their little footprints in the back of them and little tiny fingerprints, Usen said. It just made me angry and curious. A paternity test comparing Rasmussen blood from prison in a sample police had from five-year-old Lisa showed Rasmussen was not her father. In 2003, when the San Bernardino Sheriff Department opened a new case aimed at finding Lisa biological family, she was approximately 22 years old. After countless hours of research, genetic re genealogic Ray Venter found Armand Baudin, Lisa Materno's grandfather. Here's a picture of the grandfather. I was contacted one day by my nephew, and he was working with the sheriff department out in California, Armand Arba, Baudin told 2020. They requested for me to do a DNA test, and they discovered that I was the actual grandfather. Armand Baudin, daughter, Denise Baudin, is Lisa's mother. Lisa was born Dans Baudin in 1981, Arma Baudin said. She was only five months old when they left Manchester, New Hampshire, Arma Baudin said. Rasmussen, other biological children, when authorities traced all Rasmussen allies back to his true name, they found that in the early 70s, he had been married and fathered four children from the marriage. All of them are still alive. My father's real full name is Terry Pedar Rasmussen, and he was born December 23rd of 1943, Diane Kofler told 2020. This is Diane Kofler, one of his four biological children, Terry Rasmussen fathered in his first marriage. She said her mother is Rasmussen, got married in 1968 in Hawaii. My father's been out of my life since I was like six or seven, she said. We have his eyes, I do my sister does and my brother does. I do know that my brother tells me all that I can get from her is that he was the great love of her life. She said, I don't know if my mother knew his capacity of violence, but I don't believe that she knew about this, his ability to kill women and children. If my mother wouldn't have left my father, it could have been me, she said. Would have been me. If you have any information about this missing case, you know what to do.
join National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Thank you for listening to my stories. Histoire Mysterieuse, I hope you do like my videos. And if you do like my videos and you want to follow me, it's free. Subscribe, share, and like. Thank you.